Okay, um, we are going to get started. Um, let me say welcome uh, to this panel, uh, which is on ADB's Evolution Roadmap Update to Strategy 2030. Um, I am Scott Morris. I'm a Vice President at ADB for East Asia, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Um, it's been one year since ADB first began discussing the MDB Evolution Agenda with our shareholders. Uh, in this session, we will discuss MDB evolution after a year, including emerging priorities, implementation progress by various MDBs globally, and ADB's own evolution roadmap, as articulated in the ongoing Strategy 2030 midterm review. I'm looking forward to a discussion this afternoon and hearing uh, the views, particularly of our panel, on ADB's own evolution journey to date in the context of the broader discussions globally on proposals being considered under the midterm review and on how reforms can be effectively implemented to achieve transformative change for ADB, for its clients, and in supporting global and regional public goods. Um, let me say I, I'm particularly excited about this panel. I had no hand in the composition, but I couldn't have done better myself. Uh, really, um, uh, an excellent group of panelists. Let me, let me introduce them. Uh, briefly in the order on my page. So uh, Ms. Alexia Latortu is Assistant Secretary for International Trade and Development at the U.S. Treasury Department. Um, Alexia has um, many, many years of experience in the development community in, in various roles, but including long tenures in the Treasury Department, uh, so speaks with great authority on, on these issues from, from the U.S. perspective. Um, next, we have Minister Saber Hossein Chowdhury, member of the Bangladesh Parliament and Minister of Environment, Forest, and Climate Change. Last year, the minister was appointed as a special envoy to Bangladesh as Prime Minister for Environment and Climate Change, playing a crucial role in the global climate negotiations. Executive Director Rachel Thompson is, is on the AD board, ADB board, uh, representing a remarkably diverse constituency. <laughs> Um, and I will name them just to prove that. Uh, so our, our host country, Georgia, uh, but also Australia, Azerbaijan, Cambodia, Hong Kong, Kiribati, federal states of Micronesia, Nauru, Palau, Solomon Islands, and Tuvalu. Uh, and E.D. Rachel will be sharing the views of the Pacific Island members in particular that her suite represents. Um, next speaker on our panel lineup is, is my colleague, Vice President, Bargov Dasgupta, uh, as VP of Market Solutions, Bargov oversees the Private Sector Operations Department and the Office of Markets Development in PPPs. Um, also a relative new newcomer like myself uh, to, to ADB. Um, uh, and last but not least, uh, Kelly Sims Gallagher, who is currently Dean at Interim and Professor of Energy and Environmental Policy at the Fletcher School, Tufts University. Uh, there, she directs the Climate Policy Lab and the Center for International Environment and Resource Policy. Um, and as we will learn more, and, and I, I will preview now, we've, we've had really a, a unique and innovative partnership um, uh, under, under Kelly's leadership at Fletcher um, uh, uh, and, and with uh, really widespread participation within ADB. So we'll, we'll talk more about that. Um, so um, I'm going to pose a first round of, of uh, opening questions uh, to our panelists, and we will take it from there. I, I will commit to allowing enough time uh, for audience members uh, to, to ask their own questions before uh, we wrap up. Um, one housekeeping note um, is that this session will be recorded, is being recorded. So. Um, Alexia, if I can begin with you, um, I think you're well positioned to give us more of the global context for what, you know, the intensive work we're doing in, in ADB does have a, a, a global context in terms of uh, what is now described as the MDB evolution agenda. But I, you know, I can think back to um, the, the very early discussions around this and particularly key statements and comments and convenings that Secretary U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has done uh, in, in trying to define some of the contours of this agenda, and I think successfully so. So let me turn to you 
to give us an update on, on how you see that, um, not just for us at ADB, but for the other institutions that are implicated. Thank you so much, Scott, and it's great to be here and, and on this panel. And Scott did not say this, but I followed his him his job um, at Treasury, so I was following big uh, big big footsteps. And I went to school at Fletcher, so very happy that Kelly is is here. Um, I want to start um, answering your question, Scott, by asking folks in the room: Do you know what the heat index in Bangkok was this week? Hmm? 45 higher, 48 higher, 52, 52. So before answering, you know, what have we done in a year, I just want to provide a reminder of why um, the MDB evolution agenda was launched. And it was launched because the kinds of challenges that countries are facing today are different from the ones that countries were facing when the uh, Bretton Woods institutions were created. And that's the fact that we have these big, big global challenges that are not only threatening to re reverse development gains, they are already reversing development gains. And ch climate change is one such example with dire consequences on all aspects of, of, of society and economies. So that's why. Um, and so indeed, Secretary Yellen was very key in saying, you know, the development banks need to help um, um, countries address these global challenges, climate change, but also pandemics, fragility, and conflict. And my short answer to your question is, I think we've come a long way, and MDB evolution is at the center of the development agenda. That's true at the G20, but perhaps even more importantly, it's true in the boardrooms of the MDBs um, where we're seeing this fully front and center of the agenda. My second sort of bottom line up front will be, however, we cannot be complacent. I'll describe some of the progress in a second, but for me, the biggest risk to MDB evolution is if we uh, stop providing political attention and deep technical work to this agenda. It needs sustained uh, attention to really deliver on its full promise. With that said, what have we done in a year? So the agenda really focused on four main pillars, um, updating the mission and vision of MDBs to integrate these global challenges, um, updating the incentive structures of the MDBs, updating their operating models and updating and strengthening their financial capacity. We've done a lot collectively. I'll start with the World Bank and then come to the Asian Development Bank. The World Bank, as you may know, has updated its vision statement uh, so that it now fully integrates tackling global challenges um, as key to being able to reduce poverty and achieving um, uh, uh, shared prosperity so that the new mission statement is ending poverty on a livable planet. And of course, these are not just words, but from the mission statement, everything is trickling down into the institution. In terms of incentives, the World Bank has adopted a new financial incentives framework. The idea is simple. If a country, including a middle-income country, so not just an IDA country, but an IBRD country, is doing um, the hard things and making investments um, to tackle um, uh, global or regional challenges, so they're bearing the costs the benefits are cross-border, so to the region, to the world, they should get some help from the global community. So that can be an additional volume, it can be in longer tenures, or it can be in lower pricing. Um, with respect to the operating uh, model, we see a lot of changes from the way that country diagnostics are done, the country engagement model being changed, and the new corporate scorecard. So the vision trickles through all the machinery of the institution. There was also a new crisis response toolkit that was issued that included climate debt resilient clauses for countries. And on financial capacity, the World Bank uh, was able to take measures linked to the Capital Adequacy Framework Report that released $50 billion of additional hel hel uh, headroom from responsibly um, um, stretching their balance sheets. Asian Development Bank, which frankly started this work a little bit later, because shareholders came to it a bit later, I think has actually been a first mover in many instances. Um, and perhaps one of the strongest places is around how it's updated its capital adequacy framework. It's really remarkable to see 
that without threatening the triple A, Asian Development Bank is unlocking $100 billion over the next 10 years. That's a 40% increase in lending capacity. But not just that. ADB has been particularly strong on innovative financing mechanisms um, by thinking through the use of guaranteed platforms to unlock more money for climate, for example, through IFCAP. Asian Development Bank has also been clear about the vision and mission piece. Um, I have not seen another president be so eloquent as Masa around the fact that you simply cannot develop if you don't do it in harmony with the planet and absolutely um, integrating the concept of climate and development being mutually reinforcing um, goals as well. We have the Climate uh, Change Action Plan. We've seen um, the climate numbers coming out of ADB um, reach a record high, $9.5 billion. And, and I hope Kelly will talk about this, investing in staff so that staff are trained up to be able to deploy this new capacity well through an innovative training program with the Fletcher School that I'm sure Kelly um, will talk about. So I think we've made a down payment on evolution for countries, which is the goal, to tangibly fill the benefits of this, we still have a lot of work to be done, which is why we can't be complacent. And I will just um, highlight one particular area for now, and hopefully we can discuss more with further questions, maybe two areas. One is around private capital mobilization. However much headroom is unlocked, it will never suffice to meet countries' needs. And so how the ADB and other development banks uses its expertise, its policy engagement, and its balance sheet to be able to bring in the private sector, corporates, financial investment into the regions and in the, uh, the countries in the region is foundationally important. I don't think we have the right incentives, the right targets in place yet to really deliver and the right set of, of, of credit enhancement tools to fully deliver on this agenda. The last thing I'll say is that the real promise of evolution is also not about each development bank evolving, but about how they work together as a system evolving. And that's a huge agenda. Can development banks agree to mutual reliance on environmental social procurement standards? Can development banks at the programmatic level do better work together? Can the development banks from a financial innovation perspective, for example, deriving more value from callable capital, move together as a group? I think the answer is yes. On callable capital, there was a big step that happened around spring meetings. On country programmatic work, I hope that we hear from the Minister of the Environment about the recently launched Bangladesh Climate and Development Platform, which I think is very promising. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alexa. That's, that's an excellent start for us. Um, we will uh, take all of the positive endorsements you offered for uh, where ADB has made progress. Um, I think you've teed up Bargoff very well on, on private sector, and we'll come back to that. Um, but, but in moving to the minister, let me, let me go back to Alexia's starting point, which is uh, to make clear the reality of, of the climate shocks that are happening right now. So for you and where you sit in your government, um, if you can translate the realities you're facing into w what your expectations are in, in your engagement, particularly with ADB. Um, what, what do we need to be doing better? Um, where have you seen good progress? Um, any reflections you have there would be very helpful. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. I think to uh, follow up on what Alexia was saying, the first point is time isn't on our side. I think that's something that has to be clearly understood by all concerned. And I was intrigued by the choice of the word evolution because I think what you need is a revolution and something even, even quicker. Uh, and you're looking at 2030. Uh, we already know that um, you know, we were looking at 1.5 based on pledges and if they're 100% delivered, you're looking at 2.6 degrees Celsius rise. Even one-tenth of a degree makes a huge difference. So I think the basic premise is can we really look at climate change in the way we are business as usual, uh, wherein we are actually creating the problem faster than we are solving it. You cannot solve a problem by growing the problem. So to me, the mitigation piece is absolutely critical because there are limits to adaptation, there are limits to resilience, and if temperature continue to rise the way they are, 
no matter what amount of reform you do with the MDBs, no matter what platforms we put up in Bangladesh, it is simply not going to be enough. So that has to be understood. And what are the needs? Looking at, uh, as per Paris, 2.3, 2.4 trillion in 2030. So we are looking to make a transition from billions to trillions at a time when the billion hasn't been delivered. You know, the billions haven't been delivered. So let us not underestimate the extent of the challenge. To what extent are we actually able to meet the needs? And look at a country like Bangladesh, despite all of the remarkable progress, we stand to lose 2% of our GDP by 2050, 9% of our GDP by the end of the century. Food security, all of the development planes, climate displacement, refugees. You know, we only have two hands. So how many leaks can you stop in a barrel? And we are increasingly having to choose between fighting poverty, supporting our development aspirations, and fighting climate change. That is a choice that no country should be forced to make. So this really is the reality. And while there has been progress, you know, there has been developments. Uh, we see ADB. You know, we are also looking at a Bangladesh Climate Development Partnership. Uh, we looked at the recent spring meetings in, in DC. Uh, but I don't think it's enough. And uh, so we have to look at the disease itself and not the symptoms of the disease. So we have to look at decarbonization. We have to move away from fossil fuels. Where are those signals? You know, we, we don't see that. We are still talking about pledges. Uh, when there is no delivery. And I think the whole issue of global trust, global solidarity, there's a huge deficit. And each time a commitment is not honored, it becomes more difficult for you to bridge the gap. So it's not just climate change and development. This is a litmus test for multilateralism. Are we able to come together as a global community and solve the problems? If we can do it with climate, maybe we can also be able to do it with others. So I think that is really the context on which, on which we are speaking. So we are looking at not just incremental changes. You know, we are looking at leaps. And uh, what I see at the moment are incremental changes. There is a huge issue in terms of mobilizing private capital for adaptation. You know, so if we are having to fund adaptation, then doing it in commercial terms or loans simply is not going to work. So we need grants, we need concessionary finance for adaptation, maybe for mitigation, you know, which uh, generate revenues. We can talk about other forms of financing. So the public funding, the public funding source is still going to be critical when it comes to adaptation. Thank you very much. And I, I think you've given us um, some indications of why both President Moss's messages, but also, you know, fundamentally our, our approach at ADB to define ourselves as a climate bank for the region, that th this is not, a, you know, this is not detracting from our core development mission. It, it, it is um, inextricably linked. Um, but, you, but you've certainly set a scale of ambition for us where it's clear that as much as we've unlocked in our own financing capacity, um, uh, that, that there's, there's much greater need. Um, and again, I I am pointing to my colleague who, who will be speaking to uh, how we approach this through private sector partnerships. But, but um, let me turn uh, next to you, Rachel, and, and, and I am not actually going to limit you uh, to your Pacific Island uh, uh, members and your constituency, uh, but you know, uh, there are uh, unique needs there. I, I do think I want to take full advantage, though, of uh, the, the position you have, because you, you do speak for a very diverse constituency, including within the Pacific Islands. Um, and you do so, uh, you know, from my observation, you've done the work uh, to speak uh, on behalf of your constituents. I, I, I've really seen that. So we're, we, we can gain a lot from the perspectives you're going to offer um, from where you sit, please. No, thank you, Scott. And it's, um, this afternoon is quite timely because I, I had the, my annual opportunity to to receive the, the wise counsel and guidance of my constituency governors um, this morning. I'm incredibly fortunate to, um, to be serving um, such a, an experienced and um, you know, very professional group um, of, of ADB governors. And um, uh, 
we actually posed a question to them this morning about what they needed in the context of our, our midterm review of strategy 2030 of, you know, what could be some of the enhanced areas of focus for ADB that would be meaningful to them in the context of, of their own sort of nationally determined contributions or their own sort of development ambitions. And one of my Pacific governors um, <laughs> said to me, he said, Rachel, I, I need you to stop asking me what I need and I need you to start delivering. Um, which fortunately we know each other very well. So it was, it was I, I understood the spirit in which it was offered, but I think that very nicely encapsulates, I think, the, the growing palpable sense of frustration that I encounter um, when I travel around Pacific, particularly when I travel around the Pacific, and as you've noted, I've certainly had the, the privilege both of um, going myself and also taking board colleagues with me so they can see firsthand, you know, the challenges facing particularly low-lying adult states. Um, and so, and as you observed, Minister, you know, time isn't on our side and we really need, if I can paraphrase you, I think, you know, we need to, <laughs> we don't solve a problem by admiring it. And so I think at the core of what we are really trying to do with this midterm review of our, of our core corporate strategy is sort of work out how we as an institution are going to go beyond admiring the problem to providing genuine solutions that will be transformative for our member, member countries. Um, and so I might sort of reflect on, on a couple of ways in which I think we're going to uh, both challenges and I think opportunities for us as, as an institution. Um, so the first one is, is dollars, and Alexia referred to, um, you know, the, the new lending headroom um, unlocked by our new capital adequacy um, framework, which is absolutely, I was very, very happy to join colleagues in supporting that last year. Um, but the reality is, you know, we, it's, it's not as though there was, it's not as though there was demand out there sort of waiting, just waiting for us to create more supply. Um, so part of what we are going to need to do as a board is really think hard about how we utilise this additional lending headroom. What's the balance between sort of ordinary capital resource terms? Where do we need to be offering concessionality? I think one space that would be very meaningful for, for certainly a number of my members is thinking about how we can do more to help members um, deal with their foreign exchange um, exposure and, and risk. Because I think we're embarking on this, um, on this process at a point in time where mem a lot of members across Asia and the Pacific are trying to digest the debt burden that they took on to get themselves and their communities through the pandemic. Um, at the same time as they're trying to digest that, investment needs are only growing. Um, and so I think part of what we are going to have to do as a development partner is really think very innovatively about um, how we can help members create more fiscal space um, to do the kinds of things that are aligned with their national plans and that are aligned with our sort of strategic ambitions. Um, but it, as you noted, Minister, particularly for adaptation, grants are really going to be needed. And that is definitely, I think, a, a strong ask of certainly my Pacific constituency members um, who would be the first to point out that they are critically exposed to the impacts and the consequences of a problem that they played a minute role in creating. Um, so in addition to, um, to the Asian Development Fund, and I'm thrilled that, that President Massa is, I, I think, probably as we speak, announcing the, the result of that. And I think, you know, a bigger fund that delivers more for the Pacific is, is great news and should make all those involved very proud. Um, but I think there's also more we can be doing as an institution to, to kind of help crowd in um, funding from, from other sources. So providing a platform, you know, if, if, you, want, if you want to contribute to the, to the big task of adaptation and you want to do that through an institution that has integrity, that has appropriate standards, but that is committed to getting results, then, then can I suggest you look no further than the Asian Development Bank? Um, as a plug, I'm, I'm helping you out, Bhargav. It's, it's, it's rare that the board is so helpful, I know, but... Um, but then, again, related to how we utilise this additional lending headroom, you know, a, you know, a big part of what we need to do is generate more income so that we can put more of, more of those resources to work. So that's one. People, I think, is, is I think, um, critical. And the, the Tufts um, program is, has just has been mentioned. I think we're also doing more to just uh, boost the climate literacy of the organisation more broadly. 
Um, you know, I think we have a fabulous learning and development team who's doing some outstanding work in just really trying to um, help help the organisation navigate these sort of new ways of working that we want everyone to, um, to adopt. Um, you know, culture is really hard to shift, but we're, we're giving it a red hot go. But I think absolutely essential to all of this is getting more of our people closer to clients, closer to, to, the, to the, the partners that they need to be working with and with whom they need to continue to have deep relationships of, of trust and understanding because it is through those relationships that we are, we're going to be able to convince, um, convince our partners to come with us to do the things that are hard but which need doing. Um, and then thirdly, we, we've often talked about ADB being a knowledge bank, um, and it's one of the things that I found in my 15 months on the board. It's just, for me at least, it's been a wonderful learning experience. Um, every day I run into someone in the coffee shop and I learn something new. It's just, um, it's, it's one of my favourite things about being, um, being uh, at ADB. But I think we need to find new ways of transferring that knowledge to our members. We need to put it in the hands of our staff who are in the field and give them the tools they need to, to adapt that knowledge to local conditions. Um, I think if you look at our, you know, successive um, reports on our development effectiveness and you look at some of the project success rates in more challenging environments, again, particularly in the Pacific, um, I, think, I think what we know about, uh, about our success rates should, should be causing us to really um, resource those operations in different ways. I mean, we've doubled our operations in the Pacific, I think, every five years bolstered by ADF, that is absolutely something we should be immensely proud of. Um, and certainly when I travel around the Pacific, um, without me even asking, it's one of the first things any governor or any prime minister wants to tell me is just how much they value the ADB. Responded during COVID, I think has really burnished our credentials um, as, a, as a development partner. Um, but I think we really need to, to think about sort of yeah, how we can, um, can really sort of help you know, move that forward. And then finally, um, I think uh, on capacity. Um, and again, we have really good evidence and we are a, a strongly, um, I mean, we're an institution full of engineers and economists, let's, let's be honest. Um, we love an evidence base. Um, but the evidence base we have um, really should, should be reinforcing that we know that one of the critical success factors in any, any operation is local capacity. So what we know about local capacity and its criticality, I think, should be causing us to reflect on how we can more systematically and strategically build capacity um, with our members in ways that is actually going to achieve a step change in both our ability to get things done that are important, but also in their ability um, to, to deploy their own resources to greater effect so that we can all move forward more quickly on, as Alexia noted, the, the sort of big global um, challenges, but also the things that are most, in, most resonant and most urgent for, um, for our members. Great. Thank you very much. And just as, as, as a, uh, collecting observations here, issues that I do want us to come back to, the, the, the whole set of issues around the financing we do, what's behind the headline numbers, that we are so proud of, um, and where do we need to go with that, particularly around incentives um, that, that's been alluded to. But also, just to your point, Rachel, that we are money, but we're also people as, as ADB, and I think it would be worth reflecting more, and we'll hear more from Kelly on on uh, one approach uh, to making sure that, that our, our people are in a strong position to deliver. Um, but Bargoff, let, let me now come to you uh, after I've previewed you a number of times. And uh, again, as a relative newcomer to the bank, taking on a hugely ambitious agenda, let me just um, leave it open to you to define that agenda, what the needs are and where you think we need to go as an institution when it comes to uh, the private sector relationships. Thanks, Scott. And uh, like you, I had no say in this panel, <laughs> but I, was, I felt very honored when I saw that uh, I was with uh, such uh, dignitaries. Now I'm wondering whether it was a good idea. <laughs> But uh, jokes apart, uh, so, you know, in a sense, what I can bring to this discussion is my experience as a private sector person for the last 32 years. And that's what I'll try to do and frame the challenges and the issues that we touched upon, uh, uh, you know, look at the private sector approach to it and find solutions. And obviously, collectively, 
as uh, the organization, as the MDB community, all of us have to agree that that's the right approach. So what are the big learnings, uh, you know, to put the whole conversation into context as a, as a private sector person? So the, the greatest private sector organizations, I think they do three things well in the context of the discussion that we are having. One, they're deeply customer centric. They really understand what consumers need. They spend a lot of time and energy with, for custom, with, to understand customers, get customer insights, build great relationships when it comes to B2B relationships. And through that, they understand what the customer truly values and needs, and then internally works together to create innovative solutions for those customer needs. They do not start with thinking through the, this is what I have, so let the customer take it. So that's, that's, that's I think, the, one num the number one uh, learning that uh, I can share. The second is uh, effectiveness and efficiency. Uh, and I think it comes from the fact that a private sector uh, entity is in a competitive en en environment. Whether you are solving a customer's need or not, and whether you're doing it efficiently, is a matter of survival. If you don't do it, you're you know you're not there in the marketplace, and that's a context that may be a bit different uh, from us. But we have to, given the crisis that we are talking about. I mean, you know, uh, what we don't have is the luxury of time. So given the crisis that we're talking about, we have to find a way to bring that into our thinking and our approach. So you know, th that's the second point. And the third point is what I would call execution excellence. Uh, in, uh, I would say, uh, in a sense, a bias towards execution without you know, worrying too much. You, know, you need to be sensible about what you're doing, but you don't you know, worry to the extent of becoming frozen in, in taking action. So, there are times when you don't have data of the past to take calls for the future. As a private sector enterprise, what you would do is allocate a bit of capital out and say, let's take a bit of risk. This is not betting the bank. We don't know what will happen, but let's do it because it's a crisis. We have to solve for it. So this is in the, you know, I just wanted to set the context in terms of the learning from the private sector and then try, try to maybe frame the challenges that uh, you know, I was, uh, you know, we talked about. So now, if you look at as a as a as an MDB, and when we are talking about private capital mobilization, I look at it as two customer segments. The first customer segment is our sovereigns. Uh, you know, Minister talked about what's happening in the country. You know, everywhere in Asia, we are talking about the heat stress. We have schools closed. Uh, students are not going to school. I mean, look at the uh, you know impact that that climate is creating. Now, if we have to work with sovereigns as our customer segment on the upstream side in terms of uh, you know, convincing uh, our, uh, our uh, you know, DMC sovereigns that private sector is more efficient to solve these, uh, you know, these challenges, we need a lot of work on the reform agenda. And what private sector needs uh, is two things, but, you, know, you know, specifically. One is a reasonable return on capital, and the second is consistency of policies and, and a predictability of policies. And I think one of the roles that we clearly need to have as MDBs and definitely as, as ADB is how do we use our learnings, our capabilities, our knowledge, our relationships. I think one of the best things that you know, from outside what ADB has is very strong relationship with sovereigns. So we have a fantastic team in terms of client relationship, if I can loosely call it that, when it comes to sovereigns. We are trusted. We are respected. And we have the knowledge. We know what has happened, and there are examples in one country that we can bring, you know, and 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 you know, and show as case studies to our sovereigns to build the conviction that reform and mobilization of private capital happens together. It cannot be divorced. So that's one agenda that we have to do collectively, which is our sovereign colleagues, with the private sector input, and the you know technical skill that uh, skills that the, our sectors group have. So that's one part of the agenda. And I just want to touch upon a one small example. I, you know, I want to you know, use this example to show the multiplier effect of what is possible. So we have the small uh, you know, fund that we call AP3F, which is what the, uh, the, the OMDP team uh, uses. So if you see the multiplier effect of that small fund, this is a fund for project preparation, right? So whichever way you look at it, if you look at just that fund or the other TA that supports that fund, the multiplier effect is between 64 times to 330 times. Uh, so, and this is not private sector financing. This is about the stuff that I talked about, which is working with sovereigns to 
convince them that private sector is the best way, you know, you know, best tool in terms of creating, uh, you know, effectiveness on, on delivery on some of these agenda. So that's one. The second is the second constituency that we have, second customer con constituency that we have, which is the downstream part, which is private clients. Our corporate co customers, uh, you know, our conglomerates, you know, maybe banks, maybe, you know, funds. I don't think we have complete, uh, you know, uh, clarity on how we scale that up. I mean, we've, as ADB, we've done a fair amount of work, but there's, you know, a huge opportunity. And I put it down to three Ps. One, you know, this is after we build enough relationships. So I think what we need as, as ADB is a lot more, you know, boots on the ground. I think, uh, you know, uh, Rigel talked about that. We need people on the ground to build relationship. Once we build relationship, we need to look at what are the right set of solutions that we give to those clients. The solution could be coming through our sectors group colleagues, uh, you know, in, in creating bankable, you know, you know, uh, projects for, for uh, the, the, the corporate segment. And then second thing that we need to think about is where do we mobilize private capital from? I think we've done a good job with mobilizing from the banking system and the insurance system. What we haven't built a capability is on the capital market side. And if you see globally, uh, you know, when MDBs were set up, the traditional model was originate and hold for a bank as well, right? Today, no, you know, you know, commercial bank does that. It, you know, the global banks would typically originate and distribute. We haven't built that capability. I think that's something that we should think about building. But when I talk about 3Ps, these are the products. We need new processes. Uh, you know, every morning when I came to office in my earlier job, I would think about how are we being, how are we better today than the previous day? That was what drove us. I mean, that's the only way to survive. So we don't have the luxury of time of doing this over two, three, five, ten years. We need to think about this with a lot of urgency, uh, collectively as an as an institution. And third is policies, uh, and policies of you know in multifarious policy level uh, intervention, not just within uh, ADB but also with our you know counterparties, you know credit rating agencies, uh, uh, you know you know the the the, uh, the central banks in each country because you know if you're giving a guarantee and it doesn't get accounted for in, in from a basel perspective that doesn't does, doesn't help so there are a lot of lot of issues accountants etc so there are a lot of uh, work that we need to do on on this part collectively as mdb it's not just you know uh, adb's responsibility i think we need to do all of that collectively but to me uh, i i look at the the role that we have with the two customer segments differently one, the sovereign customer segment, more in terms of creating the enabling framework for private capital to come in, whether we finance it or not. And the second is what we do with our corporate client segment to mobilize more private capital you know, uh, resources for their projects. Thank you. Thanks very much. And uh, just to highlight two issues, and particularly um, you know, what you described as the upstream and characterizing a lot of our sovereign engagement, you know, just to emphasize that point, because we are, you know, historically, we have been predominantly uh, when it comes to financing on the sovereign side, but just to recognize, uh, particularly from your perspective, that so much progress on the private sector side actually entails things like enabling environment. And, and you know, there's very hard work to do there uh, that we have been engaged in over the years, but, you know, we have to always find more effective solutions um, to address that. Um, and then I do want to come back particularly to uh, your framing around the client, because we do invoke our clients, but I think it, we should test it, and particularly with the minister of, you know, all of these things that we're busying ourselves with in terms of organizational reforms, how does it look from a client perspective? And I think that's, that's an important test. Um, but um, in terms of this first round, last but not least, so Kelly, um, let me come to you and ask you to do two things, perhaps, in opening comments. One is that we've, we've teased this uh, unique partnership uh, with the Fletcher School, uh, and you know, I, I think it is worth taking a few minutes to describe exactly what that's about, um, and what what has come of it uh, in terms of outcomes, but also uh, maybe f both through the lens that you've had through that partnership, but also your your broader um, uh, track record as a climate policymaker. Um, I would love for you to opine on on where where ADB and where MDBs are. And, and, and particularly, you know, what you see as uh, perhaps shortcomings in, in how we're tackling this agenda. So, 
Great. Well, um, first, let me just say it's been an honor for Fletcher to partner with ADB on this program, and actually a true privilege, because I think uh, we have been learning alongside you uh, what makes a transformation like ADB is attempting to do, you know, challenging, and also what what what's enabling, like, what can we do to enable this tran uh, transformation? And I think ADB really does stand out as an innovative leader in this domain by tackling this challenge head on. Um, transformation, I think, rarely comes through external shocks. Transformation almost always has to come from within. And the fact that ADB decided uh, to, to tackle some of its internal um, uh, challenges, I think, um, is a mark of true courage, actually. And I, I want to come back to that. Um, I think, you know, we've been talking about ADB's engagement with clients and with partners in the private sector. Um, but, but the work we have been doing as part of this program, I think, started with trying to think about how ADB works internally and across teams and across silos. Um, so, and then, of course, extending that to thinking about how, how ADB will work with the DMCs and, and beyond. You know, I, I say this as a policy expert and as someone who, who also has worked a lot on energy technology innovation. I don't think that climate change is, a, is at its heart a technology problem. I don't think it is at its heart even a policy problem because we have a lot of technical solutions. We have a lot of policy solutions. We probably have a lot of financial solutions. But I think it is, at its heart, a people problem. Um, people get uh, entrenched in habits, uh, in doing things the way they, they're accustomed to doing them, the way they've done them their whole career. Um, and I think our goal with this program uh, was to think about how could um, ADB think differently, work together across silos, um, and identify new solutions. Uh, and that does require courage um, to, to really be able to step back and think about that. Um, and we really wanted to try to equip and enable ADB to um, empower teams to be um, successful uh, in this quest. So um, our, two, our two key goals for the program uh, were to integrate um, climate knowledge training, and, and that was my, my half of the agenda as the co-chair of this program, with training and leadership and transformational change. So trying to put these two things together um, to be able to uh, uh, tackle this, and then to create a culture within ADB of collaboration and cross-silo thinking by practicing new ways of working. Um, and that really came down to teamwork. Um, so uh, throughout the process, and I'm looking at a bunch of people in the room who, who participated in the program, uh, we set up small sets of teams to try to um, think of creative solutions, um, transformative ways of thinking uh, that might um, allow ADB um, to to develop some innovative ideas and, and practices. Um, and I think as I uh, look at the accomplishments, we've done this program twice now um, for 100 leaders at ADB. And I, th I think I can say this as an outsider, I really see a strengthening of leadership commitment um, to this nexus uh, between climate and development. Um, and I, I really see um, not just an improvement in capability, but an, um, uh, a determination um, to find these new solutions and to, and to really experiment. Um, and I think here, uh, coming back to this question of courage, um, what I have observed is that one of the biggest internal challenges is just having the courage to take that calculated risk to try to do something differently, to experiment, um, and to come back to the minister's you know, initial comments, I think, and Alexia's comments too. We don't have time to wait until we know exactly the perfect solutions. 
Uh, we need to start um, experimenting more, trying new solutions, uh, working across teams. Um, and, and I think uh, that is what seems to be happening. I think ADB is creating a microcosm within the bank of, of how to, to do this kind of transformational change. I think it can, you know, hopefully as a next step, take that to its client relationships. Um, but also um, to the other MDBs as part of this broader process of MDB, and MDB reform uh, that we're undertaking right now. So maybe just um, to your second question, I can't help it because, you know, I, lo I love policy and <laughs> talking about policy. I think this was one of the themes that really emerged in, in the, um, the sessions that we did. There is an urgent need to... Um, to create the enabling environments through policy, working, I think, very closely with country governments. Um, and, and to me, this, this is a bottom-up process, because if the, if the countries themselves um, have a vision for how they want to uh, develop in an integrated fashion to achieve their, their economic development uh, goals, as well as their climate-related goals, and they can get the policy um, framework in place, then I do believe private sector money will start to flow. Um, and uh, of course, the MDBs can play this really important and must play a really important catalytic role um, in bringing all of the different uh, pieces of the uh, financing packages together. Um, and I, I think there's much, much more work to be done because many um, governments that I have worked with in around the world and major emerging economies have not quite figured out how to reconcile these two agendas, their development agenda and their climate agenda. No easy answers. Um, in, in fact, we often find that there are really crucial synergies um, and opportunities that are being missed um, because we have separated these two agendas for too long kept development over here, you know, and climate over here, and, and we haven't found ways to merge them. So this isn't easy, but I think it's, it's really important hard work that needs to be done. Thank can, you I, can I just maybe yeah, come please. in on that? Because I think uh, we are talking about this uh, nexus between climate and... That wasn't me. Someone doesn't want me to speak about climate and development. No, but in, in Bangladesh, we have done exactly that. You know, let's say what you've talked about is, so what we have now is we have the Bangladesh Climate Development Partnership. And the framing of that is important because it means that we are looking at development through the lens of climate. And that then gives you a whole, you know, whole new perspective. And uh, I must uh, acknowledge uh, ADB because you know, when we reached out to our uh, development partners in Bangladesh, they were one of the first to respond. So they were first movers in that. And the idea is that, one, uh, the government decides the priorities. The government is in the driving seat. You know, we try to articulate our needs. So we don't want to hear about World Bank funded projects or ADB funded projects. We want to hear about Bangladesh projects, which are assisted by development partners, whether that be USAID or anything. So I think that was a very important move from our side, a strategic move. The other, of course, is the whole of government. So, you know, I mean, it's unthinkable to think of the government machinery working in terms of working groups. Uh, they think in terms of subcommittees, but here we actually have working groups. So one is to identify the projects, is to prioritize the projects. And then how do we move from project formulation to project implementation? It's a huge challenge, and that's where capacity and everything else comes in. That's where you need the all of government, whole of society approach. So, you know, that's there. There's also the whole idea of building capacity, knowledge sharing. It's not just the amount of money we are investing in this, but also the qualitative impacts. And it's not, not quantitative, but also qualitative. And then, of course, research, which is important. So how can we shorten the learning curve when it comes to the next project? So Bangladesh has actually already done this, and I believe this is the first country in the world to have done it. Of course, you've got the JetP uh, and other initiatives, which is focused essentially on the energy sector. 
but now we are looking at it across the board in the entire development spectrum. So I just wanted to add that because you know we've been talking about this. Thank you, and, and let's let's stick with that. It's a it's a a good launching point. Um, you just made the point. You know, you, you're not you're not looking outward in terms of ADB, uh, World Bank, et cetera, and and others have alluded to this. Um, you know, I think there's a long-standing challenge around the degree to which these institutions become or ha have been insular uh, in their approaches. It's it's us and it's our counterpart in governments. Uh, but you know, one thing that does feel unique about this moment is that 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 is changing, uh, certainly on the MDB side. And in fact, the definition of this evolution agenda includes uh, a very explicit commitment um, to uh, collaborate more, to, you know, there, there's a lot under that umbrella. So I think it's worth a, you know, a, a little bit more discussion of what exactly does that mean? Um, again, there's, there's the test of what does it mean from the perspective of a client? Uh, how can we do that better? Uh, but you know, for all of us, what you know, wh what does a sort of a, a deeper level of collaboration look like? And and if it's simply defined as World Bank a ADB, uh, that strikes me as a, a pretty good starting point. But does anyone want to reflect further on that issue? Alexia, go ahead. I'm happy to jump in briefly, and I think I touched on this a bit before. Uh, and, and, and by the way, I mean, I think the evolution agenda is also about shareholders. I think it's really important to say um, evolving themselves as well, um, including on the risk uh, taking front. So, you know, questioning conventional wisdom of decades um, to look at different ways um, um, to, to support the institutions. Um, but I think I think um, the example that the minister just gave is a, is a really powerful one. Where and we've seen it in Egypt, for example, with the Nafway project. We see it in, with the Jet Peas, where it's um, collaboration with the country at the center, and the country's clearly stated ambition. It can be linked to to a range of different things, um, and then really having alignment across policy across uh, financing uh, flows as well. Um, and then I think uh, both as a, as a donor country, but then also a sort of client country, this whole of government approach is, is that you mentioned, Minister, is critical. And so for the US supporting the jet peas, it actually took a lot of work to get Treasury Department and USAID and DFC and the Department of Energy coordinated to be able to uh, maximize our own toolkit to be responsive to what Indonesia, for example, was, 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 was asking. But I think collaboration is not just about more co-financing together, so it's this alignment policy, et cetera, but it's also, you know, I, I talked about callable capital a second ago, and I think this is really important, right? So there, there is a real possibility um, that we can give much more value to the callable capital embedded in the MDB's um, um, uh, uh, financing model. But if one MDB moves alone, nothing's going to happen. And so I was you know, really proud of the ADB and other institutions that really did the hard work of following the same template, really um, um, doing stress tests to show that the probability of a call on their callable capital was very, very low, documenting that, issuing public reports around that, the major shareholders of the institutions doing the same thing uh, to show how they would respond if a call happened, to show that they would really back the institution, also publishing that. And oh, phase two is starting, but I think the credit rating agencies are looking at that movement, and they've already said on the record, the fact that it was the MDBs as a group has them paying more attention to this. So the story has not ended yet in terms of the value that, that might come, but that's a fundamental, uh, 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 I think, example. The exposure changes that the Asian Development Bank has been a part of, right? So especially the regional banks, concentration, several large markets, um, but if you can swap concentrations across different regions, that creates more space. So that's another you know, very specific um, idea. And then the other thing that I think we don't talk enough about 
is collaboration can also be about not doing something because someone else is doing it. <laughs> um, um, so I think it's, it's not always about doing everything together, but it's about understanding the ecosystem and understanding where one has real value to add um, and sometimes stepping out um, if, if needed. So these are all different elements. And then I think the last point I just want to underscore, which I think creates a lot of transaction costs, I believe, Minister, for countries, um, it creates a lot of opportunities for some consultants, but um, you know, the due diligence, the, the why, why do we have you know, for the same project you know, three different uh, 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 feasibility studies, or I mean, I think that really is not a new problem, but is one we've got to be able to solve. Um, and I'm determined to sort of do my piece for it. Those are good leading examples. I, I think, Rachel, you want to come in? And no, I think back? just to quickly come to what uh, Alexa just mentioned. Yes, I mean, one of the advantages of having a, a platform where everyone comes in is we avoid uh, fragmentation. You know, we avoid duplication. We avoid overlapping of resources. And uh, it gives us, as a country, the leverage to go to the development partner of our choice. You know, maybe ADB is not the answer for all of the challenges. So we can actually pick and choose. We can also try to negotiate the terms, you know, because obviously we will go for the most favorable terms. So, you know, if ADB is offering something and then USAID or AFD, uh, we can actually shop around. So I think that's, that's good for us. And the other thing I think is also, you know, when you talk about consultants, it's having local consultants because that's part of the capacity building. I mean, we did an evaluation of the various projects that we get funded. And sometimes the fees can be as high as 15 to 20%. So if 15 to 20% is going out to consultants, what is actually left in the project itself? So I think uh, when it comes to capacity building, when it comes to identifying our priorities, which projects will come in, so side by side, if I may just mention very briefly, we also have a climate prosperity plan. Now we all talk of climate in terms of burden, in terms of liabilities, but we also see it as an opportunity. So reframing that climate discourse is also very important. So our trajectory is from uh, vulnerability to resilience and then on to prosperity. So we also have those plans in place. And I expect that once this uh, platform is up and running, you know, we will decide which projects we put into the uh, the Climate Development Partnership and go forward. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel, please. Terrific, thanks. So I think actually uh, the Pacific is actually a, a context in which we do have some, um, some, some good stories to tell when it comes to donor coordination. Um, so a number of um, a number of donors, including ADB, World Bank, um, particularly Australia, where obviously I'm from, and New Zealand, um, we all in various ways provide budget support um, or, or policy-based lending to, to a number of, of our, our Pacific, um, Pacific family. And so um, what we now see basically at being adopted as standard practice is all four development partners having a, you know, a joint sort of reform matri matrix of actions that basically makes it possible for for the government to to focus on a on a single set of actions that all four development partners have validated as being the things that we agree kind of with the government kind of need to happen um, and then we all sort of work from that so I think that's a, a practical example of how um, development partners at least in in the Pacific have found better ways of working together I think there's absolutely sort of to sort of take that approach, I think, to, a, to new heights. Um, but I think that has, and certainly I get very strong feedback from members that I represent who use this as a, as a framework, um, that it's, it's really been sort of transformational in terms of helping them to really focus their energy. Um, and, and really also, I think, kind of helped to, to increase and to amplify the, the benefits of reform um, in terms of getting, um, you know, their, their cabinet colleagues on board, getting communities on board. So that was was one point. I mean, I think too, on in terms of, you know, what what is it going to take for greater collaboration between development partners? And and you know, I'm going to say this sort of slightly selfishly, but I think you know, boards have a have a role in kind of both permissioning um, this kind of behaviour, um, but also kind of setting creating enough enough space enough. Um, you know, tolerance for risk to allow for some experimentation. And I think that's, um, that is, uh, well, I'm a finance ministry official my, myself, so I can, uh, this is partly, a, a, you can take this as partly self-criticism, but um, 
uh, you know, allowing space for risk taking is not necessarily the something that finance ministry officials find comes comes naturally. Um, most of us kind of come out of senior executive roles where we're very used to being in the weeds. Um, a colleague uh, on, in management said to me recently, Rachel, it's that that's a great insight, but you do realise you don't you don't run ADB. Um, you're you're on the board, and I, <laughs> and I was I, I I will spare you my reaction. Um, but I think you know. One of the things that I think we, we collectively as a, as a group of directors need to do is kind of work really hard to get on the same page about um, the kind of the kind of culture we want at ADB, um, the kind of um, results um, that we expect um, management to deliver and, and what we see as being sort of most strategically important um, for the organisation. Um, and that's going to require us to to operate differently as well. And I know there's been a, a lot of focus internally on, on the, the change and the disruption that's come from the new operating model. Um, and I think we as a board kind of need to be able to embrace that ourselves. I have a, I think it's a really good rule of, um, uh, of development that, or at least being a development financier that you, you shouldn't demand of your clients um, things that you are not prepared to to do yourself, and so we we demand often a lot of our clients when it comes to reform, when it comes to change, and you know I think it it would be inauthentic of us to to kind of hold ourselves to a to a lower standard. Um, I would say that also applies on things like um, like gender, where you know we've you know we're seeing a renewed commitment by management to to gender equality, not just in our operations but also in our in our institution, and I think. Really pleasingly, ADB governors have also really responded to this as well, and we have some have some some space to go. But um, uh, certainly, when I first joined the board, um, Edi Chantel Wong from from the US was the only female executive director, and and now there's four of us. We could do with some more colleagues, but um, but we're getting there. And I think that's also, you know, perhaps my final point would be, um, you know. Part of, I think, delivering on the promise of, of MDB evolution, I think, I think greater diversity on the board, the boards of, of MDBs is incredibly important to delivering the kind of, um, uh, the kind of results from these institutions and the, the, the kind of changing culture and direction um, that, that shareholders are, are increasingly, increasingly demanding. Good, thank you. Um, I think I, I'm going to pause on my questions so that we can give the audience an opportunity to come in um, for, for more than one or two questions. So let, let me just uh, check and see if you have a question, please put your hand up. And I will, I will um, so I, I, in, the, in the very back, we will start uh, with one of our board members as well. Please, go Thank ahead. Thank you. Hi, this is a great panel. Sorry, I missed the beginning. Um, I'm Oshmi Khan. I'm uh, a Bangladeshi American and represent the U.S. as an alternate executive director at the board. I'm really pleased to hear your remarks, and I wanted to ask Minister Choudhury um, your, a question about. Obviously, Bangladesh has done a great job of really showing that there is no dichotomy between development and climate. To those who perhaps question that, what would you say? And not just from your own experience, but really just that that there isn't any trade-off between development and addressing climate. Thank you. I think, you know, if you look at the, the realities of Bangladesh as they are today, so whether it be food security, whether it be salinity intrusion, whether it be health, uh, whether it be water stress, um, whether it be more frequent and much more intense uh, disasters, impacts, we see it all. You know, and we, um, because we are forced to choose between the two, and, and I think in a way that has uh, sort of speeded up this process, we have decided to bring the two actually together. That is why I've made that fundamental point that development has to be seen through the lens of climate. That's how we framed it, climate development partnership. So for us, um, it's not just also a development challenge, it's also an existential threat for Bangladesh. So you just imagine, I presume you know there are people from South Asia familiar with the map. So we have Nepal with the Hindu Kush Himalayas to our north. So we have glacial melt. You know, uh, we will lose about 30% uh, of the glaciers in the Himalayas by 2050. Now the Himalayas are the water towers for South Asia. 600 to 700 million people depend on that. So just think of a country <coughs> for which the sources of fresh water is going to dry up. So in the short term, we have flooding, 
and in the long term, we have water stress. We have rising sea levels to the south, the Bay of Bengal, so we are sandwiched. And you know, this salinity intrusion is impacting our yield. We are going to lose land, which is going to be submerged, and we'll have millions of people who are displaced. So we don't really have the luxury of choice. We have to frame it together. And I think it's also going to be perhaps the narrative for a lot of other countries in the future. I think, you know, so Bangladesh, not just in terms of resilience, in terms of adaptation, in terms of how we are framing climate change. I think that is also an example. That is also a pioneer as we look forward. And maybe let me carry that question forward for you, Bargov, because I think there's there's a, even an added challenge if we sort of probe, you know, why climate and private sector development. So we know there's a question of scale, the resources that are necessary, but there's still the, you know, there's a challenge of what do you actually do. So when it comes to defining a climate strategy, after all, you know, we view progress on climate as a public good. So if we're thinking like economists, it's challenging then to think about how exactly do you incentivize the private sector here. So maybe you can talk about that. No, uh, absolutely. I think one of the, as I said, you know, one of the things that uh, the private sector does look at for every investment they make is, uh, as I said, policy certainty, but definitely a return on uh, on capital. And again, if you look at some of the changes over the last ten years, today when we speak about simple plain vanilla, you know, solar power, there is enough private sector capital available for that. But that wasn't the case ten years back. Why did it change? Because some you know policy changes happen in different parts of the world some governments committed to you know give some subsidy some philanthropies supported for some time some people took a bit of leap of faith and the volumes drove the price down it took us maybe 15 years in that cycle i don't think we have the you know i really like what minister said we need revolution we don't have the you know the the, the luxury of 15 years to do it this time so we need to find a way to accelerate this process for private sector to come in without support. But it won't happen without some support initially. And the support has to be through working with philanthropic capitals, you know, the grant funds that we have, the concessional capital that we are getting from uh, every source. We need to have that for the private sector to come in in some of the more difficult and challenging areas, which are today not commercially viable. But that's the role that we should play, uh, you know, finding that bridge uh, to do, make that happen at, at, at pace. Uh, once that happens, I don't think we need to worry about, you know, as I said, you know, plain vanilla solar panels uh, in countries like India, it can get done by commercial banks without any support from us. And that's what we should, uh, you know, try to galvanize it at, at speed. And maybe, Kelly, to, to press you to elaborate a bit more, if, if we're going to set the bar at revolution, um, so the issues you described, so whether it's an ADB uh, staffer working on private sector deals, or someone in one of the, the within the sector group, what does a revolutionary mindset look like in an MDB context on behalf of this agenda? Well, I, I say this as an outsider observer. Um, so, but it seems to me from the work I have done in different countries that the revolutionary approach would be really starting with the country needs. So I want to come back to that and the country vision. Um, because I think there's, there's more, even more opportunity than the minister has even identified. I mean, we not only need to think about uh, anticipating climate damages and how to minimize those, but actually create green growth. Um, because where is all of the capital going to come from? There has to be enough, you know, uh, economic growth and prosperity to sustain, uh, you know, uh, uh, the next few decades um, and to achieve all of the development outcomes that we all would like to see. Um, and I think there are even other ways to think about this in a, in a transformative way, trying to integrate, um, you know, foreign policy uh, goals, trying to integrate development goals, trying to integrate. So I'm thinking uh, one country where we've been working uh, is Ethiopia. And they've taken a, a very interesting approach to their energy system. One climate damage they're worried about is increased drought and their very hydro-dependent economy. Um, and so they worry about being able to sustain uh, their high levels of hydropower. But if they diversify to, say, gas, they're going to be importing 
costly fossil fuels, um, and they don't have the foreign exchange to do that. Um, so for them, you know, the really smart approach is a renewables approach, diversifying to other renewables, um, and they they just passed a, a reform to their renewable energy law. But the thing they haven't done is think about how can they make renewable energy part of their economy um, and get developmental benefits out of that, job benefits, um, growth benefits. And I think maybe it's too hard for a country like Ethiopia, but, but these are, that, to me, that's the really transformative kind of thinking. And that requires deep partnership, um, you know, but starting, because every country has unique needs and unique circumstances, particularly in a climate-constrained century. And the, the climate impacts that we're going to be seeing in different countries will vary a lot, whether it's a country like Nepal uh, or a, a country like Vanuatu or, you know, the, 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 the challenges are very different. But I also think the opportunities will be very different country by country. Thanks. And, I, and I'll, I'll say, you know, one of the surprises to me in, in uh, my, my brief time so far at ADB is that, you know, I came in with with the mindset of you know so there are countries where we need to focus on adaptation there are countries where we focus on mitigation that's sort of a, a framing it's pretty common you know the reality is in part because of a very different cost structure these days and you know rapid adoption you know the demand is coming from all countries for uh, renewables and you know we we have good projects so it's it's you know where where there is that demand even if these countries themselves have not been uh, uh, a major source of emissions, um, we can find ways to respond, and that, it, that's been impressive to me uh, to see. Um, back to the audience. Uh, other questions? Any hands? Wow, the, the the previous audience, the hands were going up like crazy. You, you guys are, maybe it's a little later in the day, you're a little sleepy, but... Um, okay, well, let me, um, let me come back. I, I had wanted to come back this is squarely on, on financing issues associated with us as a development bank and, and the other MDBs. So as I said, you know, there are these headline numbers and, and we, we have pointed to some of you have also, Alexi acknowledged at the outset, um, that we move very quickly uh, through capital adequacy reforms um, to identify the, you know, essentially uh, the ability to uh, do $100 billion in additional uh, uh, ordinary capital terms financing over the next decade uh, with our existing capital. Um, within that, though, the you know it, it raises questions about uh, Rachel. You raised the question of is is you know demand and and how do we actually uh, achieve um, that level of programming? One way to think about that is are the incentives right on the financing side? So there have been under the evolution agenda. There have been discussions, and I, I know there have been pretty intensive discussions at the World Bank about um, what, do, what do stronger financial incentives look like? So namely, um, should there be more concessionality? You outlined some of these in your comments. Um, how do you all evaluate that? Because, and including on the private sector side, um, how do we think about subsidies uh, in terms of the objectives we have on the private sector side? Um, and I'm not going to ask any of you to pinpoint what's the right number, what is, you know, what level of concessionality. I think the harder questions are, are actually around what's the framework for it? Um, what qualifies, what doesn't? Um, you know, where do we think these incentives are needed uh, consistent with the objectives we have? So, uh, you know, any, any um, reactions to that? Uh, wh where do we need greater uh, financial incentives beyond what we already offer? And then what are the parameters on it? Uh, may, maybe uh, from the perspective of, of, of a country that, that actually uh, that, uh, receives financing from the bank. Um, <clears throat> what do we mean by climate finance? There is no definition. You know, it's been over 30 years since the UNFCCC has been working, and we still have not been able to agree on a definition of climate finance. So when we talk about how much money has actually flowed, there's a big question mark. You know, some will say 80 billion out of the 100 has been delivered. Others will say 10 to 15, because there's a lot of repackaging, there's a lot of duplication of funding. 
So I think the first thing is, you know, we need to have clarity, even for the MDBs, what actually constitutes climate finance. There is no definition. And when we go into the UNFCCC process, there are huge discussions. Uh, I think it's very important that the MDBs, including the ADB, you align yourself to the UNFCCC process. So the upcoming COP in Baku is being tabled or labeled as the finance COP because this is when the billions will have to transition to trillions. And we have the new collective quantified goal for climate finance, which is supposed to start from 2025. I think, you know, from the point of view of Bangladesh and perhaps uh, the small island developing states, LDCs, uh, the mix has to be 50-50. And at the moment, if you look at ADB, it's probably 80-20. 80% mitigation, 20% adaptation, or maybe 75-35. And why adaptation becomes even more important is because we now have a new pillar in the UNFCCC process, which is loss and damage. So first 10 years was mitigation, next 10 years was adaptation. Then we realized we haven't done enough of both. And now we are talking about loss and damage. We don't want everything to slide into the loss and damage agenda. So the more effective the adaptation is, the more resourced your adaptation efforts are the less will be the burden on loss and damage. So whatever we invest today is always going to be less than what we will have to pay tomorrow. So I think that's where, again, the, you know, the urgency issue comes in. And I think the fundamental challenge still remains, how do we frame adaptation? How do we monetize adaptation? How do we value adaptation? So all of the three advantages that you refer to in terms of the private sector, none of them will actually apply to adaptation. And so how we take this agenda forward, you know, one is the balance between adaptation and mitigation, defining climate finance, and then ensuring that we have more effective adaptation, because that is going to be increasingly important. So mitigation, yes, even Bangladesh, you know, we are looking at mitigation and adaptation. Our global emissions are 0.46%, not even 0.5%. So we don't have to do mitigation. But we are doing it because of the co-benefits. And if I do mitigation, there are health benefits. Uh, the air is cleaner. The air pollution in less. I generate employment. I leapfrog in terms of access to new technology. You know, I can learn from all of the research that the US, for instance, is doing. So I'm not doing it to reduce emissions. You know, I'm doing it to get other co-benefits. So I think adaptation also, something has to be done. Something creative has to be done that is going to unlock the potential of the private sector and so that those funds may come in. So whether it is you know, nature-based solutions or bringing in ecotourism or you know, benefits for the community, this I think has to be reimagined because I think the part of the revolution is reimagining. We have to reimagine development. We have to reimagine partnerships. We have to reimagine funding. And that, I think, is at the essence. That's really at the core of what we are talking about. Very good. Rachel, you have the microphone okay. in your hand. Go ahead. Sorry, just uh, perhaps to, to go back to, to your earlier point about sort of mitigation and adaptation. And I think this is something we see sort of in the, in the Pacific, because for a lot of um, our, our Pacific members, the, the incentive to move to, to renewables is really sort of driven by, you know, the cost of importing fuel, which is... is is incredibly high because shipping costs, because of their remoteness, the, the shipping costs are a, often many multiples, the actual, the actual cost of the commodity itself. And so there are actually sort of significant financial resilience and, um, and you know, a broader sort of balance of payments kind of benefit from, from moving to renewables. But it also sort of, you know, I think highlights the sort of the water energy kind of food nexus in that, you know, for where we do have sort of, you know, urban agglomerations in the, in the Pacific often, you know, they're big enough to, to be able to justify, um, you know, desalination as an option for delivering clean potable water. Um, but for, the, for that plant to actually be economic in terms of delivering sort of afford, affordable resources, um, it really needs clean, affordable, reliable energy as well. And so I think increasingly we need to be thinking about not just, you know, we're going to do a desal plan and then we might think about some renewable energy and then we might think about what that means in terms of, you know, opportunities for local agriculture, but actually sort of thinking about this from a sort of um, 
more of can we can we actually sort of think about this as a you know bringing the solutions mindset and thinking about it as a programmatic approach and then adopting ad adapting rather our own internal processes to actually think about well what are the resources needed to actually make that a reality sooner rather than later and I think that's um, you know I I'm not going to uh, necessarily offer a view on your concessionality point um, because we have some some discussions um, ahead of us but but I think that's a, that's an example of kind of how some of our internal thinking um, needs to needs to change I think that that also means thinking about the kind of modalities that that we offer it, it I find it immensely frustrating when staff tell me that the board doesn't like a particular modality or we we don't like a, or there needs to be a you know relationship between this and that in order for the board to agree i think one of the other kind of big cultural shifts that we need in the institution is is people to kind of stop second guessing what what it is the board wants i think we as a board need to do a better job of articulating what it is we do want but also you know i think what what we're and I'm not going to purport to speak for all of my colleagues, but certainly as far as I am concerned, my expectation of management and of staff is that you're bringing us, you know, the, the things that you think genuinely are going to be transformational for our members and to which we can provide, um, you know, effective, um, well-priced solutions. Um, uh, that is, you know, ultimately, I think that's, uh, there needs to be a, um, you need to, I think that's the conversation we kind of we need to be having and, and perhaps just thirdly I think you know in the sort of discussion of you know um, particularly sort of water's adaptation and greater resilience to climate change look like um, one of my favorite projects from from 2023 and I, I really encourage you to look it up on our website is a an aged care project in Tonga it, it it's a it's grant funded it in dollar terms it, it's pretty it's pretty small but what we're doing is building um, what what will what will serve as evacuation centres in in the in times of, of natural disasters, which on a day to day basis will actually serve as community centres for for Tonga's um, elderly, um, uh, providing their their sort of carers with some respite, some opportunities to re engage in the local workforce, but more importantly, it will also enable them to. Um, to continue to practice their really rich and ancient oral culture, so to, to sing their songs, to, to, to be together and to practice their culture in ways that, that otherwise um, may, may well be lost. Um, and I think that's just a, to me, that is a, a wonderful example of, um, of how we also need to be thinking about, well, what is the impact on, on uh, not just the environment, but on on culture um, and the connection between culture and and the land that may may otherwise be lost if we don't act act quickly. Okay, thank you. Um, and Kelly, you wanted to come in. Yeah, I just wanted to come in on incentives um, because, of course, financial incentives can be incredibly powerful, and I can think of dozens of examples. Um, but I also wanted to make the point that non-financial incentives can be equally powerful. And financial incentives get very expensive for governments and banks quickly. <laughs> um, so I think sometimes it's worth stepping back and thinking about what are the non-financial incentives that maybe we could employ to achieve the goal. Um, and sometimes those are even more effective uh, than, than the financial incentives. And then the third point I wanted to make is that alignment of those incentives is even more important than anything else um, because we often find cases, uh, a, a lot of the work my lab does is inventorying policies and we'll find all of these inconsistent signals that are being sent to the marketplace. Um, and if you have all of this inconsistency, you know, how is the private sector to respond, right? Um, they're getting mixed incentives, mixed, mixed signals uh, to the marketplace. And, and so sometimes the, the very first step that needs to be taken is just making sure all the incentives are aligned against, against goals. Great. Uh, Bargav, go ahead. I think that's a, that's a great point. Uh, and uh, I'll just touch upon two things that you said. Uh, you, know, you know, one is this one and uh, the earlier point that you made, what E.D. Uh, Rachel said. You know, we have a 40% extra headroom, but it's about demand and supply. Uh, and the question is, do we see uh, demand there in the market to do $10 billion of extra lending? I think that's a point that we need to debate. 
in which case, how do we use that extra capital that we have uh, and create more developmental impact right now, maybe? And I think what we we see is, you know, when you look at from the from the client perspective, the demand and supply, you know, uh, you know, kind of matrix leads to uh, the right pricing for clients. And I think on in, on the ground, all of us see that that challenge. Uh, Similarly, uh, if you look at the local currency issue in the in the Asian market, I think can we use that extra capital to find solutions around that? So there are again maybe creative ways that we need to think about this rather than just saying that let's do ten billion dollars extra. Um, uh, point number one. Point number two to Kelly, I think the the when we think about the entire new ways of working, it is the organization design, the structure, the processes, and the incentives. We tend to talk a lot about incentives, and incentives can be financial, non-financial, all of that. But I think we need to think through the entire uh, stack of organization uh, processes, design, uh, and structure, and incentives uh, to be effective at, at, again, the pace that we want uh, to be effective on. And I think there's some, some uh, areas that we can maybe uh, uh, do things differently from the past uh, that we should think about. Good, thank you. I think um, so. We do actually have a hand up. We have a few minutes left, so I'm going to give this gentleman the opportunity uh, to ask a, a brief question. Thank you very much. My name is Walter Vitti, a representative of the private sector uh, in transport. I'm very interested to hear the uh, topic of, from the Vice President uh, to do returns, so get acknowledgement of the return on the investment. The Minister from Bangladesh highlighting the tens of years to realise as well as to plan. What I'm also understanding or uh, questioning, let's say, is the long-term vision of a strategy and with the parallel objective of that transparency to the private sector for having a 50-year plan or a 100-year plan for your member countries. It's not exactly a question, but is that a fearful prospect to consider such a long-term vision uh, to attract that investment as we all would like to see, to place it on the table for the private sector to think that far in advance based from your perspective. Thank you. And just to say that is the very nature of, I mean, we have a strategy 2030, so we, we, we push ourselves to, 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 to take the long view. I don't know if there are any closing reflections on on that comment and question, or anything that you wish you had covered that we hadn't covered, and you you want to address, let's just do a last round. Yeah, can I just uh, quickly respond? We have, I mean, we have the Delta plan, which goes up to 2100. But I think that's more vision, because how we where we stand, let's say in 50 years time, will determine how that plan is going to unfold. So we have intermediate stops. We have the Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan. You know, we have the LDC uh, graduation plan. So, uh, so I don't think it's, it's too long to have that. But I believe uh, one of the biggest issues is technology, the way technology is moving. You know, so whether it be AI, whether it be blockchain, and we have not talked about it. So I think the other aspect is other than just financial flows, you know, we also have to look at means of implementation in terms of capacity building in terms of access to the latest technology. I think so how the Asian Development Bank is going to address that issue. It's not always dollars that we look for. You know, so how do we upgrade our research ability? Uh, how can we learn from the projects that we have uh, already undertaken? So I think that is also an important part of the, of the support we have. But again, time is running out. Delivery has to be fast. For us, I think there's also an obligation we have to ensure that the funds that we receive for climate are actually going to those who are most in need. You know, so we also have to get our act together in terms of our mechanisms, in terms of transparency, in terms of making sure those who are most vulnerable are the ones who we are able to assist. So I think it's not just ask from the MDBs. I think we are also aware as a government, as a country, that there are also things that we need to do. Uh, any other closing comments? Uh, Maybe just very quickly. Um, first on concessionality. I mean, the U.S. has always prioritized the most concessional funding for low-income countries, and that remains a big priority. But I think we've also learned 
that there is a need for some greater concessionality on some of those um, uh, uh, global public goods. And, and, and I think it will have to always be minimal concessionality because we have to be honest, it's the most scarce type of funding. And so the frameworks we're thinking about that and the link between the sovereign and the non-sovereign side so that you're always thinking for this intervention, what is the way that I can do it with zero or least concessionality so that there is space to have concessionality where it's absolutely needed? So I think we have, it's, it's gonna take more thinking than just two big buckets. So it's harder work, but that's what we're called to do. I also just wanna to touch on the culture point. I mean, I think fundamentally everything we've been discussing is, is about, it's about cultural change. Um, it's about leadership um, and, and it's about taking responsibility uh, for for getting to yes more than often um, than getting to no, um, and 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 that takes courage to underscore um, a point that Kelly made. And then my final thought is, you know, I think we need to not uh, run away from complexity. I think we need to not wallow in complexity, but we need to work through it, because what we're talking about requires a systems approach. That's messier. That's more complex. But it, we have no choice but to get it right. Okay, so we're going to close on that comment, and and let me offer as a as a reassurance to our panelists that you know your comments are not just going out there vaguely into the universe. The, you're speaking directly to very active discussions we're having in ADB. So this has been uh, really an extraordinarily helpful conversation for us at the bank, and and I think it has given us a lot that we can reflect on in the months ahead. Um, so. My personal thanks, but let me let me ask all of you to thank our panelists for this excellent discussion.